the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, The Flying Lighter that doomed Admiral Yamamoto. Tactics and strategy, a couple of climbing life hacks. And Metal Beasts, a top-tier Swedish fighter. At BR 9.0 of the Swedish Aviation Tree, we can find the J-32B, a Saab 32 Lansen variant, created to serve as an all-weather jet fighter. This is one of the top aircraft of the Swedish tree, combining high climb rate, balanced weapons, and avionics. There's a radar under the nose cowl, and next to it, there are four 30mm Akan guns, copied from the British Aden ones. Additional armament of the aircraft consists of the M57 unguided missiles and the Robot 24 air-to-air -air missiles. You might recognize them under a more familiar name, the Sidewinder B. The pilots are protected from enemy fire by a steel plate, armored seats, and a 50mm bulletproof glass. In the wings, and in the central part of the fuselage, we can see self-sealing fuel tanks. The machine is powered by the forced turbojet RM6A engine, which is the Swedish version of the British Rolls-Royce Avon. This is a classic fighter jet, and its arsenal is perfectly suitable for fighting enemy subsonic aircraft. A burst from four guns will instantly disable any light-armored target in close combat, and should you feel like fighting at long and medium distances, there are some guided missiles at your disposal as well. On the other hand, what you've got here is one of the very first modifications of such missiles, so it's best to use them when the target flies in a straight line. These old sidewinders aren't particularly maneuverable. The aircraft itself isn't too twisty, and the fuselage can't withstand overloads very well. But the combination of a forced engine and an incredible climb rate makes the Lansen just the perfect machine for boom and zooming. Gain the desired altitude at the beginning of the match, choose a target, get close to it, smash it with a powerful burst, and then quickly fly back up. This is exactly the tactic to reveal the true virtues of the Swede. Thanks to its radar, the aircraft is also effective while fighting at high altitudes. Here, your avionics will work a lot better. While some of your Tier 6 opponents won't be able to boast of such equipment, still, try avoiding duels with Tier 7 fighter jets. The MiG-21s or the American Phantoms will easily beat the Swede in his own game of boom and zooming. In 1937, the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service ordered the Mitsubishi Corporation to create a new bomber. They demanded it to have a combat radius of at least 2,000 kilometers and a cruising speed of 450 kilometers per hour. It also had to carry a torpedo on internal suspension, so the bomb hatch must have been very long. Plus, it had to be speedy enough to successfully escape fighter jets. As for the range, <laughs> you won't believe it. They wanted it to be long enough for the bomber to serve as a front line and strategic one at the same time. Aircraft designer Kiro Honjo objected that a strategic bomber is better to have four engines, like the American B-17. But the fleet leadership rejected this thought in quite a sharp manner. Build a twin-engine bomber. Achieve the required parameters, at any cost. It was impossible to prove anything to the command, so Honjo and his engineers started getting the demanded numbers simply by sacrificing everything else. You wanted range? Okay. 
we'll put some integral fuel tanks of sufficient capacity inside the wing. And the fact that they aren't self-sealing and will catch fire after you so much as sneeze at them, well, there wasn't a word about that in the brief. Speed? <laughs> what speed? Honjo barely convinced the military to allow him to put more powerful engines inside this machine. Fighters were becoming speedier by the minute, and the bomber surely could flee from a leisurely biplane, but it could never break away from a new wave fighter. Life seemed to mock the leadership of the Imperial Navy, tenderly indulging their misconceptions for the time being. The first G4M1s were very successfully used in China, almost without losses, because they were accompanied by the latest zeros that the Chinese I-16s tried not to get involved with. On the very first day of the Pacific War, the Bettys, as they were called by the military, successfully bombed the Clarkfield airfield in the Philippines, destroying dozens of American fighters and bombers at once. But they were actually extremely lucky that day. The Japanese arrived just at the moment when the Americans were refueling on the ground. Half an hour earlier or later, and the valiant air samurais wouldn't stand a chance. In addition, it was the Betty who was lucky enough to sink the British HMS Prince of Wales battleship, along with the HMS Repulse battle cruiser. The ships were really doomed. They had been engaged in a long, exhausting battle, used up all their ammunition, and had no recon intel to rely on. Truth be told, anything could have sunk them. But the leadership saw a pattern where there was a series of coincidences and felt very enthusiastic about the latest bomber. They required it to be built in as large quantities as possible. And then the reckoning came. As soon as a Betty would encounter the slightest organized resistance, it would burn. Not just burn, but explode on its own gas vapors. The American pilots even started calling it the Flying Lighter, and their combat instructions advised them not to attack these bombers at close range, otherwise there was a risk of being hit by its explosion. But despite everything, Admiral Yamamoto loved the G4M and enjoyed flying it, until one day he met a squadron of lightnings. The high-speed bomber failed to break away from them, and the Imperial Navy Air Service finally started to understand that Kiro Honjo wasn't just talking about four engines for no reason. It was the summer of 1943, and there were only prototypes of any Japanese four-engine bombers existing. At the same time, in the USA, the mass production of the B-29 was already unfolding in full swing. Recently, you asked us in the hotline, how do you climb correctly? We answered in general terms, but decided on occasion to return to the topic in greater detail. After all, there really are many nuances here. Airplanes of different countries often behave very differently. For starters, a general tip. You should lighten the plane as much as possible. It's amazing how many players still take off with full fuel tanks, you know, just in case. There's no need to do this. It's better to wisely assess how much time you actually plan to spend in the air. Usually, it won't be longer than about 15 to 20 minutes. It's better to miscalculate once, because the alternative is entering every battle on an overloaded and clumsy machine. Okay, we've figured out the fuel. Now. Here's a little life hack. As you well know, the optimal climb angles can significantly vary for different aircraft. So you have to study each model and remember a lot of numbers. But there's another approach to this problem. Try focusing not on the angle, but on the speed. Keep the indicated speed stably around 280, 290 kilometers per hour. This parameter is called IAS on the screen, and you can vary the angle so as not to slow down or accelerate. 
Basically, pick any angle that will keep you within this speed range. For most of the aircraft in War Thunder, this approach will be close to optimum. We could have ended it there, but the variety of designs sometimes creates some tactical nuances for climbing on different machines. For example, in the American Tree, there are a lot of escort aircraft with powerful engines designed for high altitudes, but their climb rate leaves much to be desired. When piloting them, it's reasonable to climb facing, not the enemy, but to the side, so that you can reach the desired altitude first and then engage those opponents in relative comfort. With Soviet aviation, things are different. There aren't many high-altitude aircraft, most of them are designed for altitudes of up to 4 kilometers. Of course, their limit is much higher, but we're talking about optimum conditions here. For example, on the LA-7, the afterburner becomes ineffective above 3 kilometers due to the peculiar design of the supercharger. Does it still make sense to climb higher? Yes. You don't want to give the altitude and therefore initiative to the enemy, do you? You just need to take these aspects of the plane's behavior into consideration so that they don't surprise you. Finally, German aviation represents a third case. Historically, the main opponents for these planes have been two completely opposite types of aircraft. On the one hand, they were fast Soviet fighters. On the other, high-altitude Allied bombers. As a result, German designers tried to achieve high climb rates in order to quickly reach enemy bombers and, at the same time, evade fighter jets. A typical example of such a solution is the line of Messerschmitt 109. They can immediately climb facing the enemy without wasting time. But keep in mind that, upon climbing, the 109s will gradually begin giving way to Allied aircraft. They can reveal only a small part of their potential in battles happening at altitudes of 7 to 8 kilometers. Well, let's hope that these tips will help you avoid the basic and most common mistakes. The rest will come with practice and thoughtful study of your machine. And now, it's time to answer some of your questions from the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Effie Kaplan. I played this game for four years, and I finally get my first purchase premium vehicle thanks for the New Year's sale. I think you should do it more often. Thank you for your support, and congrats on the purchase. We would gladly do more of these New Year's sales, but unfortunately, New Year only happens once a year, and the dates of that event are quite fixed. Can you believe it? Thankfully, we can and will do more sales honoring other valuable dates during the coming year. Keep an eye open for those announcements. Mawa11 asks, Will you ever do a Metal Beasts section on the XP-55? <laughs> Please, it's my favorite. Hi there. The XP-55 Ascender is surely one of the most unconventional fighters in War Thunder. There's plenty to talk about from its design and to its control nuances. We'd be happy to give some spotlight for this one in the future. Then there is a question sent by Matthias de la Fuente. Will we ever get another chance at getting the Katyusha? I've missed the past events. Can't promise anything yet, but let's say we'll keep that in mind and try to figure something out in the future. Tobias has another question. Does it make a difference if you take less fuel into battle? Something like less weight? <laughs> it sure does. More experienced players rarely take off on a fully fueled aircraft. Usually, it's quite enough to fuel it for 15 to 20 minutes of flight. And yes, giving away extra fuel, you will receive additional maneuverability and higher climb speed, which is especially important at the start of a battle before you've even started wasting any of your fuel. And the last message for today was written by Galenjins. 
Hey, I saw something I was playing with bots, and one was called Bruce. So I have a theory. Is bot names are War Thunder, devs, and team? It's all a lot simpler, really. When the amount of active players in the game goes off the charts, Gaijin employees have to log in themselves and substitute for the bots to give them at least some time to take a breather. So you might see a lot of familiar names among bots if you look closer. Well, that's your lot for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. So come on, people, subscribe. Ring that metal by clicking the bell. Leave a like, because you really do. And don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments. We want them and need them. See you in a week.